call the meeting to order. Yeah, I'm not getting any of this. Okay. Will you please call the roll? Commissioner Burke. Commissioner Dunn. Present. Commissioner Burke. Here. Commissioner Gambetti. Mr. Guardino. Present. Commissioner Inman. Here. Mr. Keto. Here. Commissioner Ben Knight. Here. Here. Commissioner Tabaloni. Here. Chair Alvarado. Yes. Okay. Um, Ann is here. Are we ready? Okay. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to move to um, um, to item three, resolutions of necessity. Stephen. Yes, commissioners. Item three is a resolutions of necessity appearance. You did commission did receive a letter from the property owner indicating that they are now appearing via correspondence all issues have been solved they do want to enter their letter into the record having said that staff recommends that you approve this resolution of necessity second motion by tavaloni second by Medaffer. questions all those in favor please say aye aye opposed ayes have it um Item four, which is approval of the minutes. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Dunn, second by Tavaloni. Questions? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? No, I want it. Ayes have it. Um, item five, commissioners meeting for compensation. Who, who did the motion? Jim Gilmetti made the motion, <coughs> second by Tavaloni. Questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thanks. Okay. We'll go back to item two. Welcome to the region. Ann? Commissioners, good afternoon and welcome to Riverside. We are trying to hold on for a few minutes. Assembly member Sabrina Cervantes is on her way here, so she may still arrive sometime in the next half hour, 45 minutes, and I'm sure she'll want to say hello when she gets here. But again, uh, thank you for coming to Riverside. It's always a pleasure to see you here in December. I'd also like to express my appreciation to all of uh, you who came to our great event this morning out in Norco, Horsetown, USA where we had the groundbreaking for the I-15 Express Lanes project. It's a really important project for this reason, region and it dovetails into the completed 91 corridor. But I do need to tell you, as those of you who heard this morning, while we, we have invested over $2 billion into these two corridors, we have much more work that needs to be done. So far, we've been doing this with uh, toll revenue bonds, Measure A, a little bit of federal grant funding but we're really looking to make sure that we can move other projects in the region and in those corridors as well. So our work has just started. There's a lot more that we need to do here. Riverside is an exciting, growing place, lots of population uh, growth anticipated, and uh, we're gonna plan on continuing this trend. Again, welcome to Riverside. We're delighted to have you here, and you've got a lot of challenging work ahead of you. I would also like to let you know that uh, RCTC, working in partnership with Caltrans, all of the local agencies in Riverside County, as well as our partners in San Bernardino, we're all very focused on SB1 projects, making sure we get them out on the street, make sure that we get them delivered because that's what people expect us to do. And so we're, we're committed to doing that in partnership with all of you. So thank you and welcome to Riverside. Thank you. Susan. <clears throat> Um, commissioners, I wanted to um, call up Janet Dawson if she's here. I was looking around the room, and if she's, oh, there she is, okay. Uh, commissioners, I wanted to start out by recognizing Janet Dawson today on her retirement, and then I have some additional um, remarks that I wanted to share with you. So Janet, would you come up here? Right, Janet. So Janet Dawson, um, as we all know, has served the public of this great state for a number, many years. I don't know how many years, I actually don't have that in my remarks, but 
Janet, you are a true role model to others on what it means to be a public servant. And I've seen that in every, every time I've worked with you uh, over the years. And I did make a, a few remarks that I wanted to share. The commissioners may have some remarks as well. But um, you know, you have truly worked tirelessly. I've seen over the years where Janet is, and one example is working together with you on SV1. Um, you know, we were over at the Capitol, and it was late at night, and we were walking back. And Janet said, um, I'll, if you walk me to your car, um, I'll drive you to your car. So I walked with her to the parking, her parking garage. We get in the car. She takes me to my car, and it's very late at night. And when she leaves me there, she says, well, I'm going to go back to work. And I just was like, well, then I need to go with you. <laughs> and, um, but you also have been, today, I, I just wanted to share with everyone what a true partner you have been with the commission, uh, with all the commissioners, with me personally. And I wanted to thank you for that on behalf of the commission and me. Uh, Janet has worked on bills, many bills, that have provided a new statutory responsibility for the commission. Most recently, Janet, uh, there's quite a few bills, but the ones that I could think of most recently would be As Assembly Bill 194. Assembly Member Frazier authored that bill. Janet worked tirelessly with, um, you know, she sought out commission staff input but I know she worked with the regional agencies. She worked with Caltrans. She always wants to get her recommendations to her member to get it right. And I just see that in you. And what that bill has done now is provided an opportunity for toll facilities in the state to be approved by this commission. And in the past, a toll facility, in order for it to move forward, it required one-off legislation. And so for that, you know, this state on behalf of the commission, we're truly grateful. It will make a difference in California. And then the other bill was AB 14. This was um, Assembly Member Lowenthal's bill that Janet worked very, very hard on. That created now the requirement for a California Freight Advisory Committee to have a role, public, private sector, to come together and develop a plan for California for our freight program. This is a, a, a bill that the commission is looking to as we move forward on uh, programming projects for freight funding is a critical, critical uh, bill. And we're greatly, greatly appreciative of your efforts. The other one, Senate Bill 486, we all know that we're working on um, right now in, in implementing that bill. That was a Desania bill, I believe. And uh, Janet, while she's in the assembly, worked with Eric Thronson and the authors and her, her member and got that bill through. And that was a, a bill that now will help to inform the investments that are made in the shop. It's a critical piece of legislation for bringing about transparency of public investments. And there's more to that bill as, as, as well. Uh, but most recently, we all know Senate Bill 1. And Janet was right there. I saw her in the midst of what really happens into um, coming up with legislation. And she worked so hard. And one thing I would say about Janet is that she always speaks her mind. She always shares exactly what she thinks. And she does that because she's doing it in the public's interest. And I have so much respect for you, Janet. And I just, I just wanted, I have more, but I think I'm going to run out of time. I just want to thank you for everything. And I, I appreciate that once legislation is passed, you've never walked away. And you always follow it through in watching how we implement. And I just value our friendship moving forward. Thanks. And lastly, Janet, we do want to present you with this resolution. And um, won't go into it all, but and um, just want to thank you for everything.
as, as Janet makes her way down, I'd like to thank her uh, over the years for just being the adult in the room. <laughs> I mean, when you got knuckleheads like Frazier and me and Art <laughs> chirping, and she would just go, stop. <laughs> but it's pretty hilarious, and, it, and the state is losing uh, a very, very valuable employee, especially ARP. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Commissioners, I had a few more um, items to report in my, under my, my item. I wanted to let you all know that we have made a series of hires, uh, additions to our staff as in regards to implementing Senate Bill 1, and I wanted to let you know their names. They will be present at the January Commission meeting so you, that you can see them. We have hired Denise Mitchell. She serves as the, as the administrative assistant to myself. She has over 15 years of office, office administration and nine years with the state of California and various departments. We um, recently hired Joe Phil Borja. He's the new assistant deputy director for legislative affairs. He was previously the Legislative and Public Affairs Manager for the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. He's a Berkeley Matsui Fellow for former Assemblyman Warren Fortani and the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. He serves currently as a member for the Sacramento County Public Health Advocacy Board, the Cal Asian Chamber of Commerce, and Heritage Community Credit Union. He graduated from UC Berkeley. We recently hired Terry Anderson. We need to thank Director Dougherty for this employee. Um, Terry is a registered civil engineer who comes to the commission with 17 years of Caltrans work experience. Her experience spanned the inspired spectrum of project delivery, right-of-way agent, transportation planner, traffic operations, electrical design, roadway design, construction inspection, project management, and most recently overseeing the training and development of project engineers. Prior to working at Caltrans, Terry was a high school math teacher for 10 years. We also hired Mark Berry. He's a graduate from UC Santa Cruz. He has a master's degree in urban and regional planning from San Jose a State. He has worked as a land use and economics consultant for CBRE. He joined Caltrans to manage the planning public engagement contract and administer environmental justice grants. We also hired James Molinbinski. He's uh, the commission's new budget analyst. He uh, is assuming the position that Deborah McKee held. He has a background in finance and administration from the US Job Corps Center in Sacramento, where he prepared budgets, provided financial analysts, administrative support for over five years. Prior to that, he worked in finance and accounting with Intel and for Ernst & Young's business valuation group. We also hired Matthew Yazgott. He's the new associate deputy director uh, for the California Transportation Commission. He comes to the commission from the California Department of Healthcare Services. He uh, has experience in Medicaid financing, program development and management, and stakeholder engagement. He has a bachelor's degree in government from California State University, Sacramento, and a master's degree in public policy for California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo. We've also brought Juan Guzman back to assist us. You all know Juan. Uh, his, his experience speaks for itself. We're so grateful to have him back as a retired annuitant. And commissioners, uh, these staff um, changes, these, these new hires, it just it shows you the amount of workload that the commission has assumed. And we've assumed this to date with our, um, our very small, talented, hardworking staff. And you know the, the goal here is to provide them some relief. And I know that we will. I, I believe we've made very good hires. Then I want to give you an update on Assembly Bill 179. This is Assembly Member Cervantes' bill. She will be here later today. But wanted to let you know this is the bill that requires that the commission hold two meetings a year. I have had meetings with um, Air Resources Board uh, staff, including the executive director. We're working together on a joint agenda, which I'll be sharing with you. And I would appreciate if any of you have ideas for those meetings to please give me a call or um, send me a note. And lastly, wanted to just um, let you know that we have a road charge meeting on Friday. And we expect it to be pretty well attended among the TAC members. And so with that, in conclusion, just once again, want to recognize and thank our, our great staff for all the work that they're doing. And with that, commissioners, that concludes my report.
Any questions? Commissioners, they're actually not here today, given our budget. I didn't, we didn't bring them all. They will all be there, in, and they're working. We will bring them all to you at the January meeting, and um, I'll ask them to stand, and I won't give you as much detail on their background, but just a little bit to remind you who's who. Thank you. Okay, item seven, commissioner reports. Uh, if I may, this is more on the personal nature than, than commission related. Uh, the foundation that we run had our 13th annual Silicon Valley Turkey Trot on Thanksgiving morning. 23,000 of our closest friends showed up in downtown San Jose, which we hope allows us to give away about 900,000 this year to local nonprofits helping local families in need. And for our hardworking commission staff, uh, during a break, we have shirts here that are not only sized but gender specific so enjoy and colleagues i know you all want to have one of these shirts yours are up here uh, and uh, we hope to see you all at our santa run on december 17th Six thousand people dressed like santa claus chasing the grinch our county tax assessor for, for three <laughs> months okay <laughs> Lucy, then. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just a, a note. Um, I was uh, honored to be part of a, uh, an SB1 forum this past Tuesday. Commissioner Inman was there. Commissioner Tavoloni was also there. Uh, a joint project of Caltrans District 8 and 12, um, partnering with the transportation community. Um, very informative, I think. Um, but. 200, 250 folks at the Riverside Convention Center. So just thank you, uh, our Caltrans districts, for stepping up and trying to get out the word. Really appreciate it. Am I on? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to let the commission know, uh, last uh, Wednesday I was uh, honored to join uh, Lori Berman, uh, the Deputy uh, Director, Sandag uh, Personnel, North County Transit, at uh, the um, groundbreaking for the restoration of the San Alijo Lagoon, which is part of the uh, North County Corridor uh, improvements on the I-5. Uh, it was very well attended, a beautiful sunny day. The trains were going back and forth. This, um, this improvement to the lagoon is going to restore tidal flushing and the biodiversity of the lagoon by uh, lengthening the bridge span and reducing the uh, footprints of the uh, bridge support. So it's a literally, you know, one of those win-wins we're always talking about, and it was a great day. So thank you for letting me tell you about it. So you just turned on his, like, yours is right. He's, you're over there. Yeah, okay, I'm, 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 I got you. You're you on. got me, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. <laughs> Outside, the commissioners took a look at the um, first, and I'm not going to say too much about it, but one of the, if, if the first hydrogen sweeper, I guess maybe I could say the world or whatever, but rather than me making a lot of mistakes here, I'd like to invite uh, Director John Belinsky up to give us the true skinny on what this does and maybe where the costs are or whatever you may want to tell us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for indulging me for just a couple of minutes. Um, some of you did join me outside to take a look at the first ever, first in the world, hydrogen powered sweeper um, that will be used by Caltrans and um, right here in the Inland Empire. Um, this sweeper cost about $800,000. Um, a normal um, diesel-powered sweeper costs about $500,000. Um, the reason being that the cost is it's the first of its kind, obviously. Um, and um, again, this will be used in the Inland Empire, um, and the purpose is to, of course, reduce the amount of carbon that we generate um, you, you'll see, you'll have a presentation in a little bit about innovation. 
um, in, at Caltrans. And this is certainly one of the elements that we have, uh, that we're implementing in the department to address and to focus on innovation. So if there's any questions, I'd be willing to answer those. Yes, uh, John, could, could you, and I was talking, and I'm sorry, but, but the cost on this hydrogen versus the regular diesel? Um, the cost of this is about $800,000 $800, uh, to produce this machine. It's built right here in the Inland Empire in San Bernardino County. They produce um, about 90% of the sweepers that we use um, at Caltrans statewide. A normal diesel-powered sweeper costs about 500000 okay. Lifespan for each? Lifespan of a diesel-generated um, sweeper is about nine years, eight to nine years. Um, this one we're expected to last, it's expected to last about 12 years. And, and did I understand correctly that when you made a deal on this, that being the first and only in the world that, that uh, Caltrans was to receive two and a half percent commission on each one sold? I don't <laughs> recall ever saying that, but if, if that is true, that would be great. Well, I, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you'd look into that. Please. Okay, we do expect to obviously um, get some additional ones once we run testing that, um, to ensure that this one operates properly. Further questions? Christine and Fran. Just uh, my compliments uh, to um, Caltrans for bringing on uh, this new technology, especially being made in, in, in state. Uh, Anything we can do to reduce air pollution. I just drove up from San Diego, so believe me, on this very, very bad day with fires growing, uh, all over Southern California and the wind and everything. So I commend you for uh, looking at something innovative. And uh, actually, I expected the differential to be greater uh, for, a pro you know, not a prototype, but the first one. Hopefully, uh, you know, as production increases, uh, that uh, price for the hydrogen technology will come down. It's the right way to go, so thank you. Certainly, and the big challenge, of course, is having sufficient facilities where we'll be able to fuel those machines. Hi, John. Could you talk just a little bit about why you think this particular application is a good place to kind of do some of our R&D in terms okay. of the duty cycle Certainly. and the work that uh, Certainly. Um, sweeper needs So we to do. have a significant number of pieces of equipment that we use for maintenance. Um, a lot of high-powered equipment is needed. Um, in this particular case, we selected the sweeper because it's a low-speed vehicle um, when it's operating. So it can operate on a full tank um, for a full day without having to go back and fuel it. We can fuel it at the end of the day. That's one of the reasons why we selected the sweeper. And yes, Commissioner Edmund, mm. it does go uphill. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Matt from the Air District. Maybe he'd like to make a little donation into our cause here. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, I have, have one more item that I'd like to show everyone. These are the our new signs that will go on every project on the SB1 that um, we think is going to be great. And, and these signs will be put up by the contractor and, and will have a different uh, look than we have today on, on all the others. But I thought that these are great, that uh, it's, it's really going to catch the eye, I think. Of course, it'll be a little larger than that, so. Good, thank you. Good job. Anybody else? Okay, then we'll go to the, uh, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my report today is uh, really uh, an acknowledgement uh, of sorts. I uh, noticed on the agenda today that the commission will have before it the uh, final couple of guidelines to adopt that uh, help implement SB1. And I just wanted to take a moment to uh, reflect on all that we asked the commission to do with the passage of SB1 and to help implement SB1 as quickly as we could. And in the last uh, several months since June, 
since the kickoff of the implementation of SB1 and the adoption of a schedule. Uh, the staff under the leadership of Susan Branson uh, has d just done tremendous work to get us to this point. And I, I just wanted to take a moment and acknowledge that and Mitch and his team and everybody over there. Um, this is hard stuff. These guidelines are not easy. And it took a long, long time to do them for uh, Proposition 1B purposes back in 2006. Um, and of course, we're in a pretty serious and you know, significant fight to maintain SB1. And a very important element of that is to uh, move forward with uh, awards to competitive programs that you all will be uh, taking on come spring of 18. And uh, I think that's when this commission will really step forward and uh, do its best work to implement that, that legislation and uh, really meet the promise of the bill, uh, which is to invest in rebuilding the state. And it all starts with the very difficult work that you guys have done. And I, uh, you know, I, I don't, there's no other update I wanna give that matters as much <laughs> as this. And I just wanna, again, acknowledge the staff because um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long trudge of, of uh, work and public comments and hearings and workshops to get it done and uh, you guys have actions to take uh, during this hearing uh, but I did want to acknowledge the work of the last six months and tell you how much I appreciate uh, the fact that we're now uh, at the precipice of awarding uh, a grants from SB1 for projects up and down the state of California so Mr. Chairman uh, that's all I wanted to say today thank you thank you any questions Malcolm Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Appreciate the opportunity to provide uh, uh, some updates. The first I'll start with is just uh, from my perspective, some of the uh, updates on some of the fires that are uh, being dealt with in Southern California. There are three major fires. Uh, yesterday, it had implications and impacts on uh, Interstate 5 north of LA as well as the 210. Uh, yesterday, we were able to reopen uh, Interstate 5. Today, we were able to reopen uh, Interstate 210. Uh, then the third fire was the, uh, uh, the Skirball fire, which is uh, up in the uh, Getty Museum, uh, Bel Air area, uh, west on the west side of that, uh, or the east side of the 405, but caused the closure of the 405. Southbound lanes were opened earlier today, and actually several northbound lanes are now open as of about 15 minutes ago. There's still some lanes closed on the outside for some of the firefighting activities. Um, from a, from just from a state standpoint and an emergency standpoint, this... This, is, this may get worse before it gets better. There's a little bit of a reprieve with the winds today. Believe it or not, the winds were worse yesterday and the winds are scheduled to get worse again tonight and then carry into uh, Friday. So <coughs> certainly thoughts and our hats off to first responders um, and allied agencies with CAL FIRE and, and uh, CHP uh, as well as LA FIRE. But uh, certainly uh, significant implications in this uh, looks and, and smells a lot like what we dealt with in Northern California in the Santa Rosa area. Um, but we continue to try to help with evacuations and do repairs to facilities and reopen facilities uh, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, another item that I wanted to share with you is unfortunate news that we lost a Caltrans employee in the line of duty uh, last weekend. Uh, a toll taker uh, on the Bay Bridge was killed uh, in the line of duty, uh, C.C. Han. Um, her memorial service will be uh, on uh, Friday. Uh, it was a uh, errant vehicle, a truck, a box truck, uh, with an apparent uh, DUI individual behind the wheel uh, that crossed several lanes, crashed into several cars before uh, it hit the toll booth uh, that CC was uh, occupying and, and working. Um, one thing that we always try to do is support the co-workers to the best of our ability as well as support the family. Um, we have established a California Transportation Foundation um, fundraising account which is up and running uh, today to try to support uh, CC's family. Uh, she's uh, survived by her husband Ryan and a 10-year-old uh, daughter. So uh, Caltrans is trying to rally behind her friends and co-workers as well as her family. Um, but uh, I wanted to provide you that update. The other item I was going to share is, uh, and actually uh, it was mentioned earlier by uh, Commissioner Dunn, was the SB1 forums that we're doing throughout the state. Um, we uh, uh, obviously did the one in this area uh, last week. We had one in the San Joaquin Valley uh, on Tuesday, uh, and we have one in the District 4 area on Monday, and that's the uh, end of a series of SB1 uh, forums throughout the state to talk about what opportunities it presents 
in, in many forms. Um, and they have been very well attended across the state. So that's been uh, very informative for locals as well as to, for us to get feedback um, from folks in that regard. We will be making a presentation under the innovation uh, title later today on the Bay Bridge uh, implosions and some of the creative tacks that we took to save time and money on that. Uh, I will defer all that conversation till that agenda item, but I think you will enjoy seeing some of the uh, innovative uh, approaches we took uh, to handle in that task. I was also going to uh, uh, mention the uh, sweeper, but I think John spoke uh, on that uh, very eloquently. The one thing that I would add to that is this: it, when, you, when you build the first and you only build one, it is more expensive. And as we procure more of these, the cost of that uh, piece of equipment will go down. Um, and I think we'll close the gap uh, between a traditional sweeper uh, cost and uh, this uh, first of its kind uh, sweeper. Um, so I think that that will be um, on the horizon. And lastly, I will uh, make two announcements. Uh, my chief of staff, Dara, Dara Wheeler, has been named the chief of the Division of Rail and Mass Transportation. She'll uh, take over that duty uh, as of January 1st. She's helping me with the transition um, to the next chief of staff between now and then. And then we also appointed Janice Benton as the uh, new design division chief of uh, uh, division chief uh, of design up in headquarters. She replaces. Uh, uh, Tim Craggs, who retired uh, previously. So I wanted to make those announcements and welcome them to their positions. Uh, and in each instance, we had somebody uh, acting um, behind them. Kyle uh, Gradinger in uh, mass tra rail and mass trans. And then uh, also, um, I'm forgetting, uh, design division chief is was from San Diego. Lori, where's Lori? Tom. Uh, filling in and uh, I always uh, am very appreciative of uh, the efforts that uh, folks do to take on additional responsibilities. So with that, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I will end my comments and answer any questions that you may have. Very good. After this morning, um, everybody's favorite cowboy, Vince Mamano. He's got that walk to him now, doesn't he? <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, congratulations on the the project this morning, the 15 there in uh, Riverside. That's a, another great example. Uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to do a topping off ceremony for the Gerald Desmond Bridge Towers, tallest, uh, what are they, 515 feet, second tallest towers in the one of the uh, Cable State Bridge in the country. Uh, very, very impressive. Uh, I, I continue to talk about the things that are done here in California that are just the people around the country are watching to see how things work. Uh, Gerald Desmond Bridge was a good example of the people watching to see how we were going to handle the new Buy America requirements that we had uh, that were national, nationally changed. And Gerald Desmond Bridge was the first big project out of the chute in the country. Uh, and I had people in Florida saying, Vince, I saw an agreement that you and Malcolm signed the other day. And this was about two weeks after Malcolm and I come, came to terms with that agreement on how we were going to move forward with by America here in California. And uh, so the rest of the country and the rest of the world is watching California, the, the innovative financing that you take advantage of, uh, your ability to accelerate projects, move them up. You know, SB1 happening, I think, is fantastic. The opportunity the, to get the projects out. Um, we're looking forward to making sure we have uh, DBE uh, groups uh, as part of this. And, and a lot of projects are going to be coming, and which means there's going to be a lot of impact to tribes around the state. So I'm hoping that everybody remembers to, to make sure they're reaching out to the tribes and tribes being at the table while decisions are being made, not here's an answer you can comment on it. So that's our hope that that continues. We have a continuing resolution for federal funding that ends on December 8th. So we are hoping there was something that was a, a, a bill that was submitted that would extend it till December 22nd. That's our funding. So we have an authorization that takes us the five year authorization, but yearly we get our appropriations and that's what we're talking about here, appropriations. So when you hear government shutdown, that's what we're talking about. Uh, so we're hoping we're getting a little bit longer term than December 22nd, but we'll see what happens. Uh, December 8th is when ours ends. Uh, Paul Trombino, who is our nominated administrator for the Federal Highway Administration. He was cleared through the uh, Senate EPW uh, committee late in October, and the, now the next step is to go to full Senate uh, vote, and that hasn't been scheduled yet. 
uh, Brandy Hendrickson, our acting administrator, and Butch Weidlick, our uh, executive director, who used to be in my position here in California, testified before the House sub Subcommittee, uh, Transportation, Housing, Urban Development, um, on the administration's request for an additional $415 million in emergency relief funds. So that's something that we try and do periodically to, to remind uh, Congress that we, we have a lot of uh, need here for the emergency program, uh, especially here in California. As Malcolm says, it's very difficult to hold up the edge of the continent. Um, so transportation performance management, uh, all of those are final. Um, we are looking, working with Caltrans and the MPOs and the uh, regional transportation agencies to work and, and try and move forward with, uh, coordinate with them and trying to implement that. And I think the, the biggest thing we're gonna see is the results driven program as we move forward. And that's, that's our, our goal. With all of that, one big thing that's happening here, I don't know if it touches everybody up here, but it's gonna to touch a lot of people behind me. Uh, the project, we're, we're doing a project authorization and close out um, workshop here in California it's with Federal Highway and Caltrans. We're sitting down and going through our project, authoriz authorizing projects and how we close out projects. We're going through that process to try and steam, streamline that. The, the ideal, the, the goals from that are getting projects in the, pro, in the, the pipeline earlier, uh, and then closing them out and allowing that money that's sitting on those projects that haven't been closed out to be put back into, into motion and we get more projects out of those. So that's going to be a good, uh, a good effort. And nationally, we're doing an MPO, uh, freight assessment. So nationally, our headquarters is looking at all the MPOs around the, the country. We're looking at focusing on identifying planning and project development. Uh, activities and the tips and and looking at to improve reliability of travel and uh, goods movements uh, on the NHS I think that's a big uh, a, a good opportunity it's a it's a great focus I think it's more focus I think than we've ever had over the last several years uh, and we're continuing to try and move on that want to uh, also congratulate Janet Dawson I, I call her a quitter but uh, since she's retiring but uh, I'm jealous <laughs> is all it is uh, Janet, Janet and I, I met Janet early in my career here and her and I talked one time and she said, Vince, we're talking about proposed legislation here in the state and we're not sure if that's going to impact, if your decision might impact that. And I said, well, you know, come over and let's talk about it. And I can tell you, I can't lobby, I can't tell you, I think you should pass it or I shouldn't pass it, but I can tell you that federal law says this and this is what my response is if I get this. and. Uh, um, and it was a great opportunity to, to, to get to know your process, the, the legislative process that happens. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, to, to you, like you said, Susan, some of you can trust, some of you appreciate her commitment. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for her, and, and, uh, and it's really it, it's an, a relationship that we didn't have with Federal Highway that we now have, thank to, thanks to Janet. And if the new guy, hopefully the new guy doesn't screw it up as he moves forward with it. So. <laughs> We'll see how that goes, but uh, but Jan, I, I I've got a great deal of respect for you. She's uh, I I hope when I retire, uh, it's one of those hopes. If you hope when you retire that you have the respect that she has from a lot of people, that's a, that's a great thing to hope for. Lastly, I want to introduce uh, Monica Gordeen. Monica, you're gonna have to raise your hand, and Paul Schneider. So Paul Schneider, Paul, raise your hand too. So Paul's our chief operating officer in our office up in Sacramento. Monica is the Associate Division Administrator in Southern California, so for the whole state, but her area is in Southern California. So she runs our Southern California office. Paul runs our Sacramento office, which clearly means I run nothing. Um, so if you have any questions or any issues for me, Monica and Paul would be glad to field them. Well, and I guess my next question is, what do you do? I collect great people around me to make me look very smart. And they're not that tall either, so I'm... I'm kind of tall in the circle too. And wow, I'm impressed. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Tall in the <laughs> saddle. Tall, tall in the saddle. saddle. Any questions? Thank you, cowboy. <laughs> and I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Regional agencies, Patricia. Good afternoon, Chair Alvarado, Commissioner, Secretary Kelly. Um, uh, the regional agencies asked me today to share that they are in support of the draft guidelines for the Solutions to Congested Corridors program, which are before you today in items number 18 and 19. 
Staff did an excellent job crafting guidelines that deal skillfully with the difficult and high profile issue of congestion. We are grateful for the time spent holding five workshops and reading our written comments as well. And we're happy to hear that reinforcements have been hired for the commission staff that's really been working too much. Um, with your action on the guidelines today, the competition phase of all the CTC-led SB1 programs will be fully underway. And not too long after that, um, we'll be in the project delivery phase. And arguably, that's the most critical phase for SB1. Um, the regions are ho hoping to do our part, obviously. Um, one of the things that we're doing is working with Caltrans local assistance staff to develop a workshop that we'll uh, put on this May. Uh, it's kind of a train the trainers workshop for the regional staff to make sure that new and old staff are ready for the challenge and are really prepared for successful delivery. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Real Connie's Mara. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Mara Toomey, chair of the Rural Counties Task Force. The Rural Counties met on November 17th and discussed the following issues and concerns. In regards to the implementation of SB1, the Rural Counties appreciate the insights of Chair Alvarado and Executive Director Branson, as well as the opportunity to discuss our issues and concerns at our November meeting, and welcome the opportunity to work together on the successful implementation of all these programs. In regard to the Solutions for Congested Corridors program guidelines, the Rural Counties appreciate the Commission's consideration of their concerns regarding competitive balance, flexibility, and equity, and appreciate the Commission staff's efforts to develop the program guidelines in an open and transparent manner. The rural counties support the staff recommendations to adopt the solutions for congestion corridors as proposed. The rural counties would also like to congratulate Janet Dawson on her retirement and all her help over the many years with us. That concludes my report, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Self-help counties. Looks like Sarkis is going to handle this one, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioners, uh, Sarkis Kotchik with the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments. Uh, Keith Dunn could not make it today, so he sends his apologies. Um, here to provide the Self-Help Counties update. Um, first of all, thank you to all the commissioners and CTC staff that attended the Focus on the Future conference in San Francisco. It was another successful conference and we were able to talk about many topics like SP1 and freight. And so um, we're th very thankful and we appreciate the commissioners that also participated on the final panel uh, with the regional agencies and the um, directors. Um, we are excited for 2018. Um, we look forward to our partnership with the CTC and the state. It's gonna be a very exciting year with uh, SB1 and we're um, looking forward to the continued partnership. And then uh, finally, um, we've also been participating in all the various workshops that were mentioned for SB1. Uh, we'd like to thank commission staff, um, Mitch and his staff for the cooperative and transparent process. Uh, you're, able to take our comments and work with us. And so we're very excited for that. And um, now the next phase begins. And so we um, look forward to preparing our applications, submitting them. For many of us, we're actually gonna be able to leverage a lot of our measure funds with the applications that we're submitting. So we look forward to um, delivering uh, critical projects under SP1. And uh, we are also supporting efforts to help defend SB1. Um, it's a critical program for uh, all of us. And so it's one thing that we're gonna be supporting um, everyone on those efforts. Uh, with that, that concludes my uh, update and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Item 14, Garth. Sure, uh, commissioners, uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Matt Miyasato, who's a deputy executive officer at, of uh, science and technology advancement at the uh, office uh, at the South Coast Air Quality Management District. He will provide a brief presentation on South Coast AQMD's innovation, transportation research and funding programs. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Right, great, thank you, Garth. And uh, uh, 
Welcome to the South Coast District if you're not from this area. So uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. I know several of the Commissioners, and it's good to be back here with you. Um, so Garth asked me to come and present on some of our technology advancement opportunities that we have in the district, and I'm really happy to see that fuel cell sweeper out there uh, because we need the cleanest available technologies in many different forms uh, if we're going to achieve our clean air goals. I'd be remiss if I didn't go over some background just uh, for the sake of understanding why we're so aggressively looking at advanced technologies. Many of you know we're the four county region, LA, Orange, San Bernardino, Riverside counties. Almost half of the state resides in our region. We also have 40% of all the cargo that comes in the United States comes through our two ports of LA and Long Beach. That means our region is burdened by the emissions that are associated with those goods movement uh, to the rest of the country. Uh, this is an animation that shows on a particularly bad day in our smog season. Uh, if I freeze it here, that dark purple color is are very unhealthy for everyone that's exposed to the air mass. You can see it's kind of moved into the Inland Empire, so right where we're sitting. Um, but the red is uh, unhealthy, and then the orange color is USG. That's unhealthy for sensitive groups. That's our children with developing respiratory systems, or the elderly, or those that suffer from asthma. And so this is really a health issue that we're dealing with by not meeting the federal standards, which were established to uh, be health protective. Uh, we're finding that every day, as we look at more into the health effects, it's, it's more and more uh, dire in terms of the uh, the uh, uh, effects on the, the public health as well as on the economy. In fact, the air quality seems to be getting worse if uh, not better due to some of the meteorology and some of the temperature uh, uh, conditions that we're seeing. Uh, but we know where the sources are. Their mobile sources contribute 80 to 90 percent of all the emissions that turn into smog and photochemical oxidant. We, in fact, know the sector. So if you look at this, this is projected up to two, uh, 2023. If we do nothing and just implement the rules that are on the books today, uh, we know that we need to reduce emissions by 43 to 55 percent. And the, the top uh, emitters, you can see at the top of the chart, is the conventional diesel technologies. So onward heavy duty trucks, off-road equipment, um, marine vessels, and locomotives. And so that's a, a huge amount of emissions that we need to reduce in a short amount of time. Uh, but there are signs of optimism, like that fuel cell sweeper <laughs> that I saw outside. I also drove here in a, a pure electric, uh, battery electric vehicle. There are plug-in hybrid vehicles that are available, as Commissioner Kehoe knows very well. Uh, we have fuel cell vehicles that are offered for le lease and sale. We're also seeing that technology now being transferred to medium and heavy duty sectors. So there are BYD yard tractors. There's some um, innovative companies that are supplying batteries out of China that are, that are coming into the market. Uh, but the two main things that I would point out is Toyota now has a prototype development of fuel cell Class 8 trucks that they are demonstrating. Uh, and then you probably read in the newspaper about Elon, the great disruptor is now having his own electric semi. Uh, so whether he can actually deliver on that as well as uh, the uh, Series 3, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But just the fact that he, these two large companies are investing in pure zero emission technology has got the, the traditional manufacturers really engaged now. Um, we also have a very uh, aggressive RD&D, so we have research, development, and demonstration program. We help develop an 8.9 liter natural gas engine that's 90% cleaner than the existing standard that's used today in transit buses, waste haulers, school buses. And we also help support a 12 liter engine that's 90% cleaner than existing standards, and that is going to be certified this month and rolling out in chassis in Q2 of 2018. So we have high hopes that this engine can be used for a lot of the drage truck uh, 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 that are going in and out of our ports. Uh, we also have done studies that show the natural gas technologies are actually cleaner than diesel due to the, the duty cycle and the temperature profiles for those vehicles. So I was really happy to hear the question about duty cycle from Commissioner Inman. Um, this is another technology that we're investigating. It's a trolley truck, so much like the trolleys that you see operating in, in uh, San Francisco, for example. It connects to a catenary wire. When it runs on that catenary wire, zero emissions. The innovative thing about this technology is it can come on, come on and off of that wire. The pantograph can lower, and then that truck can go into regular flow of traffic. The idea is that it charges on the line. It charges batteries. When it gets off the track, it goes into the port area or the, the warehousing uh, district and can operate in zero emissions. This is a picture of a Mack truck that was we, uh, we helped convert at the Siemens test track in Germany. And these are uh, pictures of the technologies here on Alameda Street. You can actually see the street sign there. We have a one mile test track that's, I like to say it's two miles because it's one mile up and one mile back. Um, but it's looking at battery technology. Thank you. Uh, battery technology as well as natural gas range extender. So you can think of it like a large Chevy Volt. So when the battery is depleted, then it operates on a natural gas engine. And then you saw that Mack truck uh, we are also working with the Department of Energy. It's called the Zero Emission Cargo Transport uh, uh, Project. We also have co-sponsorship from all these different entities you see here, California State uh, Energy Commission, Long Beach, both ports. 
Uh, and we're working with these innovative uh, technology providers that really want to be powertrain suppliers to look at different architectures, so battery electric, a natural gas range extended, and also fuel cell class A trucks. Uh, and we just recently won a very large uh, California Air Resources Board grant to develop zero emission dredge trucks. And the reason this is so significant is because we're finally working with the truck manufacturers directly. So before you saw that we're working with the kind of technology providers and, and parts suppliers, and now we're working with BYD, Kenworth, Peterbilt, and Volvo trucks. So I think there is a sea change going on where we're looking at battery electric technologies, natural gas range extended, and diesel plug-in hybrid electrics. Uh, and the reason we're looking at all these different technologies is not because we're schizophrenic, but because, as Inman, uh, uh, Commissioner Inman said, you have to meet the appropriate duty cycle for each technology. We believe in and around the port, yard hossers, short uh, haul can use battery electric. If you're going just 10 miles, you can probably use battery electric. Catenary, if the infrastructure is there, plug-in hybrids. Uh, if you're looking at regional haul, so into the Inland Empire, for example, then you can use a whole host of different technologies. Fuel cell is a, is a good contender because you have long range, high power, but of course the natural gas near zero engine that we talked about could be an early uh, deployment as well as these other systems. Uh, the key challenge that we face is how do we get to scale? Uh, so how do we reach that tipping point? We believe that there needs to be two, uh, two activities. One is you need to set a regulatory backstop. So some date in the future, the truck manufacturers know that they have to comply and then incentivize them to meet that deadline earlier. And so that's what we've done. We applied to the EPA to develop a lower NOx standard, 90% lower. So if going from 0.2 grams per brake horsepower hour to 0 0.02 grams. Uh, we were just back at the EPA two days ago meeting with the acting administrator or acting air director, rather, uh, and encouraging them to continue that rulemaking. And then we are also fortunate enough to receive about $250 million directly to the air districts this last legislative season uh, to uh, put into our Carl Moyer program, which is an incentive program to re replace older diesel trucks. This is a one-time shot, uh, but it's, a, it's a, a step in the right direction and a down payment on the emissions that we have to further reduce in the coming years. So with that, I'll uh, conclude. And the main, the main ask here is that we continue to work with the CTC and look for opportunities to approach the federal government as well as the state government to help us achieve our cleaner goals as well as the infrastructure needs that you have. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Questions? Lucy? Thanks for the presentation, really interesting. Uh, are you getting reception, positive reception from EPA? So it depends on who you talk to. Yeah. Uh, if we talk to the staff level folks that we've dealt with for decades, uh, they are looking at continuing the work. That, that EPA regulation for low NOx trucks has, hasn't been touched in 15 years, right? The last standard was 2010. Uh, and so they believe it is a time to revisit that rule, but uh, you know, depending on the administrator and how they want to proceed, uh, we'll see. Christine. So it's, it's difficult for sure. Very relevant question uh, from, from Commissioner Dunn. I just want to say uh, th thanks, Matt, uh, for all the work that uh, South Coast is doing. I like that you're looking at different technologies for different uh, workloads and distances. Uh, we don't know. This market is so dynamic, and there's so much research going on. Um, I, I think, you know, although it's a big investment, we have to pursue um, all the practical uh, alternatives. So um, keep up the good work and Appreciate keep your us support. informed. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Great presentation. Uh, just for the others that aren't in the trenches in the supply chain all the time, uh, order of magnitude, can you talk just a little bit about how many Class 8 vehicles we have here in California? Granted, we've got a lot of interstate commerce through, but uh, frame great. it up for our audience. Yeah, great question. So uh, as a state overall, about 400,000 Class 7 and Class 8. In the South Coast Basin, it's about 200,000. And so we're looking at uh, attacking that by looking at what we call beachheads. So one beachhead is the port complex, 15,000 dredge trucks. So if we can apply some of this incentive funding and really create a market there, then we think then you can start introducing other uh, vendors to bring in their clean technologies. But even, even on that scale, 100,000 trucks within five, six years is going to be a daunting challenge. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Item 15, Garth. Sure, Commissioners. Uh, please bear with me here while I give the, the legislative update uh, that Eric Thronson always gave so thoroughly and professionally, so I'll, I'll try my best. Um, in review of the prior legislative session, seven of the nine CTC-supported bills were chaptered into law from the prior legislative session. Uh, staff will continue to be engaged on the two-year bills and any new legislation that would uh, you know, impact the Commission. 
The session, uh, the state legislative session will reconvene on January 3rd and uh, two-year bills must pass out of all policy committees in their house of origin by January 19th. Off the floor and um, by the 31st and, or they're dead in this session. And attached as a yellow in your binder are a total of 54 bills currently being tracked by staff. 22 of these bills are being actively tracked. And then uh, Vince gave kind of a, on the federal side, Vince gave an overview in terms of some of the issues that are going on on the federal side um, in terms of potential federal shutdown. Um, there was some hope in the recent congressional tax uh, reform effort that, you know, it would address some infrastructure issues. But in fact, uh, based on the information that we were able to obtain, it appears that, uh, you know, ports and other issuers of uh, private activity bonds and the advanced refunding um, bonds for transportation projects will incur additional costs as a result of the current tax reform proposals. In addition, the current tax reform, federal uh, tax reform proposal also appears to reduce the employer paid commuter tax benefits. Lastly, it appears that any action or progress to address federal transportation infrastructure funding is continuing to slip as Congress and the president focus on you know, tax reform and then also health reform. So uh, it doesn't look real good right now, at least from what we were able to obtain in terms of a, a federal relief on, for infrastructure funding. And that concludes my update. Are there any questions? If there are any, Eric's here to answer them. Thank you. <laughs> I, um, and, and I apologize, I just don't know. Is, there, is, there, is it appropriate because the House and the Senate are doing reconciliation now on the, the two different tax bills, is it appropriate for our commission to be sending a letter in to our delegation and maybe especially our Republican delegation to ask them to reconcile in our favor on some of our infrastructure issues? Um, is that something, Susan, this one's really for you. Commissioners, you are all at this dais more experienced than I am in this regard, but it never hurts to send a letter. And if you would like to direct, this is an action item, if you would like direct, to direct staff to prepare a letter to send to our congressional delegates on this matter, we can get that done quickly and get that sent out. So that would be, um, if you would like us to do that, we'll put it together and consult with the chair and whoever the chair would like us to consult with on the commission with regards to the letter we'll be sending and then we'll get that sent over. Let's just go ahead and do that. That'd be great, through the chair, thank you. Okay, so uh, do you wanna make a motion? Uh, I'm happy to make a motion. Okay, great. Motion by Dunn. Second. Second by Inman. Questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, Tom. Anything else? Item six. Item sixteen. <coughs> it's the Mitchell and uh, Steve show. Commissioner Stephen Keck will be presenting this item for the department. <laughs> Thank you, Mitch. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioner Stephen Keck with Caltrans Budgets uh, here to give my my general presentation on budget and allocation capacity. Um, I'll start like I always do with an update on where we are with allocations to date. Um, through the October meeting, the commission has allocated almost half of the allocation capacity for the year. There's $2 billion left across all the programs uh, left to be allocated. Uh, about a billion of that is in the uh, ATP program, the TIRCP program, and some bond programs, especially Proposition 1A. Most of the capacity, uh, or about half of the remaining capacity, lies in those three programs. About 35% uh, of the shop capacity remains, and 45% of STIP capacity remains. I wanted to take a second to talk about Senate Bill 1 revenues. Um, we're all very familiar now wh where they're coming from, but um, because we just started to pay that new tax on November 1st, I thought it was worth at least mentioning um, that although the 12 cent gasoline tax went into effect November 1st. The 20 uh, cent diesel excise tax increase also went into effect as well as the sales tax increase. Those revenues won't actually flow into the state's coffers and into local coffers, or I should say state's transportation coffers and the local transportation coffers until probably January or as late as February. And that's because of the amount of time it takes for the state to collect those revenues, to go through, count all the pennies, uh, dot all the T's, cross the I's, and get the apportionments out to the recipients. So that won't actually occur until January or February. 
We don't anticipate any problems from that. We were aware of this for some time, but I, um, I thought it was important for the commission to know as well. Um, on the other hand, the, the new vehicle uh, fee, the transportation improvement fee that ranges from $25 to $175 per vehicle, those uh, will begin to be or are due for any registration uh, due after January 1st. And as it happens, folks have already paid their registration for January and the state has begun to receive uh, revenue from this source already from the DMV. Those fees are collected uh, as part of registration and deposited straight into the state highway account. We've already collected about 16 or $17 million from this source. So actually a little ahead of schedule. Um, Vince always beats me to this. I don't know why I bothered to write it down, but uh, continuing resolution does expire the 8th. I'll add that that is the day after tomorrow. So uh, uh, we hope for some sort of continuing resolution extension before then. Uh, if there is no extension, the federal government shuts down. We will continue to go about our business. We don't anticipate not doing anything because Vince has a day off. Um, but uh, it is worth noting that um, you know I was kind of hopeful last time. I think maybe a little too hopeful that uh, we were seeing a little more forward thinking, and certainly that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, Vince, or, uh, Vince also mentioned emergency relief funding. It's worth noting we were just notified in November that we will receive $127 million in uh, new federal funding. This is over and above our regular federal funding uh, for past disasters. Um, this is going as far back as 2006, and a small portion of it is for the 2017 winter storms. Um, that's a notable number because, generally speaking, Federal Highways has just $100 million per year for the entire country. So this is a, a significant uh, a number for us to get for this year, and we have our fingers crossed that some of these new appropriations will bring even more funding. Um, finally, the last uh, kind of special thing I like to do, at least one thing different every, every meeting, uh, is this new graph that we put together that um, shows the taxes you would pay for driving from Sacramento to Riverside. I picked Riverside, Chris, because that's where we are. It's about 430 miles. And when you adjust for inflation, when you drive your average vehicle in 1994 down to Riverside, you pay in excise taxes at that time was 18 cents per gallon, about $6.45 um, in today's dollars. That's adjusted for inflation. If you do it in today's average car on the road, you would pay about $5.61 in excise taxes. So you actually pay less when you adjust for inflation now than you would have in 1994. I use 1994 all the time because that is when the gas tax was last increased. So it's very difficult to ask anybody to pay more money for anything. But when you think about it, we're paying less now than we did in 1994 when we committed ourselves to that gas tax event. Uh, part of that is because of inflation, and part of that is because of the better gas mileage we get now. The little thought bubble there with I think that's a, maybe the new Tesla in the, in, the, uh, in the thought bubble is reminding us all that, of course, this is the average gasoline-powered car that we did this calculation on. It doesn't get very good gas mileage. The fleet, average fleet on the road today in California is about 12 years old. The average car is 12 years old. Um, but the new cars with better gas mileage paying less and less uh, gas taxes. And that's a subject we've hit on several times before. But I thought this was kind of a, a neat way to look at this. I actually was inspired by something Senator Bell said at the um, Focus on the Future, where he said, do the math. We're not paying our fair share. And uh, that's where this comes from. So with that, I'll end my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And as always, I'm sticking with that iHeart SB1 bumper sticker on the last page. Stephen, uh, on the federal funding update, I appreciate the fact that Vince got us $127 million. But what? Isn't it on? It's on? Yeah. <clears throat> How much have we, have we billed that hasn't been paid back yet from the feds? Do we know? I don't have that number. Can you Not find, for emergencies. I'd be curious to find out what that number is. Certainly. Because I know the money comes in slowly. Uh, uh, yeah, right. And uh, commissioners, uh, this was an issue a number of years ago when we had built up a significant amount that we had spent for uh, emergency work that hadn't been reimbursed uh, and Caltrans had reported that uh, at a, as a part of the quarterly finance report or update uh, 
it became it, it was no longer an issue so so uh, we we worked with we told Caltrans we were okay with that dropping off the report we've talked with Stephen about the the need in the current situation to include that in the quarterly report so that you get updated on that status well, at least we we would know and if there's any way to put a little pressure on the feds uh, to expedite um, those refunds it would be appreciated very much so thank you Thank you much. Item 17, Mitchell. Uh, commissioners, uh, this is an action item. This item is a SB1 implementation update. Uh, on, the agenda, on the agenda today is the adoption of the guidelines for the Solutions for Congested Corridors program. With the adoption of these guidelines, the commission will have adopted guidelines to shape more than $18 billion in SB1 investments. Also on the agenda today is the adoption of the initial list of cities and counties eligible to receive SB1 local streets and roads funding. Uh, this represents the third SB1 program under the Commission's purview to start receiving funding. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, your staff who's worked on this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the secretary was kind enough to, to, to mention me. I can tell you my big F, uh, contribution to this effort was putting a list of all the programs and adding a staff person's name to that. Uh, I would like to thank Don Chesser, Teresa Favila, Juan Guzman, Jose Osiguera, Laura Pennebaker, and Lori Waters for their effort thus far in developing guidelines. And uh, I'm sure as they all know, I, and you all know the real work, it has just begun as we rev start reviewing project list and now re work towards reviewing applications. In this book item, we're recommending uh, a minor modification to the local partnership program guidelines and the trade corner enhancement program guidelines. These guidelines anticipated the availability of web-based tools for use by applicants. These tools are not gonna be ready in the first round of uh, funding, so staff recommends deleting this reference uh, in the guidelines. With that, uh, staff recommends approval. And we have a couple of speakers before we take action. Uh, Carol Herrera. Good afternoon, commissioners. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, you just adopted guidelines, or you're going to, I guess, uh, for the trade corridor enhancement program created by SB1. Our regional and local transportation agencies are getting ready to prepare and submit an application to secure TCEP funding. Thus, our biggest hope is that the CTC gives the SB 5760 Confluence Project application its full and fair consideration in our efforts to secure an SB 1 TCP grant in April or May of 2018. 5760 Project informational handout has been placed at your places, looks like this, and uh, a, attached is a USB which uh, contains a video, construction photos, letters of support, studies, and other materials that explain the project. The handout um, explains the project and provides hard truck traffic and accident statistics of regional and national significance. So we will jump straight into our overview and background of the project. In November, Caltrans application one of the three statewide to the U.S. Department of Transportation's Infrastructure for Rebuilding America competitive grant program was submitted jointly with the regional and local transportation agencies. The 5760 Confluence Project has been deemed as a state priority during the process of identifying projects of regional and national significance and also during the designation of critical freight projects during the development of both the National Highway Freight Network and the California Freight Mobility Plan. The wide support in Washington and California culminated in the inclusion of a 205 million funding allocation in Measure M, which was of course passed by LA County Metro voters in November 2016. 
We are happy to report that through substantial local contributions from the cities of Diamond Bar and Industry, and also LA Metro funding and a $10 million Tiger Grant, we were able to fully fund phase 2B work on the westbound on and off ramps, which began construction in November of 2016. This phase of the project is anticipated to be completed by July or August of 2018. Additionally, the next phase, 2A, which is also fully funded, will be ready for construction in April, May of 2018 in preparation for the phase three freeway mainline improvements. Phase 2A of the project is anticipated to be completed by October, November 2019. The major commitment by LA Metro and Measure M is a huge step towards the funding of the Phase 3 freeway mainline, mainline improvements to the 5760 confluence. Nevertheless, we will still need approximately 50 to 60 million in current dollars to successfully complete the design and the right-of-way work for Phase 3 improvements. Furthermore, with the Measure M funding not scheduled to be available to us until 2025, we are facing the possibility of not being able to continue our work after we have completed Phase 2A, which will be the fall of 2019 and well before 2025, nearly five years of construction delay. We would like to at least complete the requisite property acquisitions and the engineering design for the Phase 3 freeway mainline improvements in advance of the 2025 release of Measure M funding with an additional allocation of state or federal dollars in the near term. The engineering design and right-of-way work can begin by October no or November 2018 and be completed by October, November 2020. A suspension of activity for as many as five to six years could be detrimental as many of the desperately needed safety and freight mobility improvements could have to wait while the accidents, good movements, delays, congestion, and air pollution, which you've just heard a report about, the problems continue to increase with regional and national implications. Moreover, the cost of the mainline improvements and the requisite property acquisitions would continue to increase, causing the overall cost of completing the project to rise significantly. This is not to mention the potential for losing the momentum that we have built up over the last 10 years, including a strong local, regional, state, and national consensus. Despite the longer range commitment to Measure M, we are optimistic that Metro would consider advancing the availability of funding if we were to receive an allocation of state or federal dollars in the near future. Again, our hope is that the CTC gives the SB 5760 Confluence Project application its full and fair consideration in our efforts to acquire an SB 1 TCEP grant in April or May of 2018. So we will be able to deliver this important project of local, regional, state, and national significance at least five years sooner. We thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. John Fasana. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission and staff, good afternoon. I'm John Fasana, I'm mayor for the city of Duarte and I'm the immediate past chair of the Los Angeles County Metro Board of Directors. I represent the San Diego Valley cities in Eastern Los Angeles County. And I wanna congratulate you and staff for expeditiously developing and adopting programs to distribute the new Senate Bill 1 revenues. SB 1, doubles the funds distributed to Caltrans and to cities in the San Gabriel Valley and across California for much needed road repair and maintenance. Particularly important is the new capacity and improvement projects that are part of the discretionary grant programs adopted by the commission. With the funds from the TCIF program from Proposition 1B nearly depleted, half of the Senate Bill 1 diesel 
tax revenues have been directed to the new trade corridor enhancement program. This program will continue to fund transformative freight movement projects across our state. And I want to speak to two of those that are regionally significant in the San Gabriel Valley uh, to help move trade along. First is a State Route 5760 freeway confluence program that Council Member Herrera just spoke to. And the second is the Alameda Corridor East uh, freight rail separations that are being built. Both these projects will receive funding from LA Metro's Major M sales tax measure, but state funds are still needed to allow the projects to move forward into construction. Both projects are priorities within the San Gabriel Valley and throughout the state as well as the region. The 5760 is the most congested freeway confluence in our region. It is ranked number one for freight delays and tra uh, truck accidents in California and number six in the nation. Freight trains traveling along the Alameda Corridor East carry about 20% of all imports and exports arriving at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, the largest in the Western Hemisphere. The ACE Corridor has been designated by Congress as a trade corridor of national significance. The Alameda Corridor East has made effective and efficient use of the Proposition 1B funds that have been provided, as you will hear this afternoon from the ACE Project CEO, Mark Christoffels, during his update report on agenda item 25. I urge your support for both projects when being evaluated as applicants for the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program. I thank you for your dedicated service on the commission and appreciate your attention to my remarks and I wish everyone a safe and productive holiday and new year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is a, an action item. Uh, Mitchell, you want to repeat the staff recommendation? Uh, yes, uh, staff is recommending the deletion uh, in the guidelines for the local partnership program and the trade corridor enhancement program of language uh, relative to web-based tools that uh, we had hoped to have developed prior to this first round. And uh, so it's just two sentences. It's a relatively minor uh, change, but we really wanted to make sure that everybody was aware in the audience that uh, there was no need to keep holding your breath for these. So there's a motion by Paul. And a second by Joe. Second by Joe. Questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. And we're going to defer the agenda for a second. Uh, Assemblywoman uh, Cervantes, is she, is she, oh, there she is. Would you like to come up and address the, the commission? Good afternoon. I just wanted uh, to say thank you for being here in Riverside County. Welcome to all the commissioners and for taking part in today's groundbreaking ceremony. It is truly an honor to represent the 60th Assembly District that does uh, consist of 40% of the city of Riverside, the city of Corona, Norco, Eastville, and Harupa Valley. Uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us, excited about the investment that is much needed across our state, and I look forward to working with each of you as we move forward, uh, Riverside County transportation infrastructure and other much needed parts of the state of California. So thank you to each of you and to, of course, uh, my very own colleague and friend, Assemblymember Jim Frazier for joining us here today. Thank you. Okay, we had a, um, a hearing scheduled, but we can't do that till 2.30, so we'll go to item 20. Mitchell? Commissioners, item 20 is an action item. This item is the adoption of the fiscal year 2017-18 road maintenance and rehabilitation account local streets and roads funding initial report of eligible cities and counties. Uh, there are two pink handouts for this item. Uh, the first handout uh, adds two pages to the back of the, uh, of the item. Uh, these contain an updated list of the eligible cities and counties that have provided information since the book item was published on uh, Monday. Uh, the other is a one-page uh, handout which uh, includes the uh, cities with the outstanding project list. Uh, 
Through this program, SB1 dedicates significant funding to addressing basic road maintenance rehabilitation and critical safety needs on the local streets and roads system. This funding nearly doubles the state support for local streets and roads. To establish eligibility, cities and counties were required to submit by October 16th a list of projects proposed to be funded. This list was inquired, is required to include a description and location for each project, a proposed schedule for the completion of each project, and the estimated useful life of each project. Additionally, each jurisdiction was required to submit a copy of the resolution adopting the list. Upon commission adoption of this list, staff will transmit the list to the state controller. The controller is expected to begin apportioning funds to these jurisdictions in late January or early February. Staff has reviewed the submittals and worked with cities and counties to ensure completeness of the submittals. This was a significant undertaking. Uh, I would like to thank Juan Guzman, Ann Johnson, Megan Petroncelli, and Laura Pennebaker. Without their efforts, we could not have accomplished these reviews so quickly. I would also uh, like to thank Caltrans's IT staff. Uh, their uh, IT director, George Akiyama, his, his people are putting together that Rebuilding California website. And uh, they needed this data. And when we told them our staff was limited in uh, ability to process this, we only have so many staff, he asked, how many people do, they, do we need? And the next day, he had assigned two or three people to help do this, and they just dove right in. And uh, we really appreciated their, both their, uh, the work that they did and the promptness with, with which they undertook it. To date, we have received complete submittals from all the counties and 95% of the state's 481 cities. Uh, the single page pink handout contains the list of cities for which we do not have complete submittals. Uh, at the top of that page is uh, five cities who uh, had council meetings today or, or excuse me, yesterday or Monday. Uh, four of those five have uh, uh, approved the resolution and submitted, submitted to, staff, to staff. Uh, only the uh, city of Sebastopol on that list of five was an, a, unable to uh, get that done. And so they'll go down into the list of uh, what is now uh, nine cities that have uh, submitted information to the commission, but not complete information. In addition to those nine cities, we have 13 cities uh, for which commission staff has not received uh, anything. We will continue to work with these cities. Uh, the controller will retain the city's portion of funds for 90 days. Uh, staff will present a updated list to the commission at our January 31 commission meeting, uh, which includes anyone who's able to uh, provide the information that we need. Any cities not on the list at that time will not receive funding in 17-18. Uh, uh, with that, staff re recommends approval of the city county list and uh, the direction to transmit the list to state controllers. Okay, we, we have a couple speakers. Um, Alan Young has submitted a letter that we will enter into the record. And we have a speaker, Patricia Romo. Good afternoon, commissioners, and welcome to Riverside County. Uh, I'm Patty Romo, and I'm the transportation director for the Riverside County Transportation Department. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to talk to you about what SB1 means for Riverside County. Riverside County maintains over 200, 2,200 miles of roads and over 100 bridges. Throughout the county, and the county is quite large. It extends all the way to the state of Arizona. And gas tax is our primary source of revenue to maintain and improve the, our roads and bridges. If we were to assign Riverside County roads a grade today, it would be a C minus. Uh, gas tax revenue had declined for us by about 30% in recent years. And if left unchanged, our road condition was expected to have declined to a letter grade of D um, within five years. Um, we've had difficult just performing routine maintenance with the gas tax revenue at the levels that we're receiving today. Uh, but with the passage of SB1, it's expected to increase our gas tax revenue by about 40%. Um, 
by 2020 from the levels that we were seeing in 2013-14. And it'll give us the ability to fix the most distressed roads while continuing to keep our good roads in good condition. The county is accelerating these paving projects throughout the communities in the county with the first SB1 paving project starting construction this month. The county plans to invest over 42 million on 600 miles of road over the next two fiscal years in pavement upgrades and we expect that over the next 10 years we'll be able to improve our average pavement condition to a B rating. The pavement projects moving forward will not only improve pavement condition, but will improve mobility for bicyclists, pedestrians, transit users, through shoulder widening, sidewalk improvements, and bus turnouts. And through the hard work of Senator Roth and Assemblywoman Cervantes, we now have the funds to build three major projects in the county, the uh, Hamner Avenue Bridge over the Santa Ana River, the Limonite Interchange, and a new grade separation in, in uh, Harupa Valley. In addition, these funds will provide for certainty in making commi commitments to the public to improve county roads for future years. Prior to the passage of SB1, we didn't have certainty of what we would receive from year to year. And revenues decline, were in a decline and they fluctuated dramatically from year to year, causing an inability to plan work for future years. So stable, reliable funding source will allow the county to plan for the future. We're focused and we're committed to improving the quality of infrastructure for our residents. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and for your continued support for transportation projects in Riverside County. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe there was a motion for Commissioner Medaffer to adopt. Was there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Dunn. Okay, go ahead. I just want to say that this is so amazing. There's a great story to be told here. When our gas taxes all went up on November 1st, and what is this, like 95% of our cities have very quickly demonstrated why they needed to go up because the need has, is so great all over the state. I mean, 4,100 projects, it's astounding. And that's a great story to tell that I think sort of gets lost in just talking about, quote, SB1. Your gas taxes went up. We're trying to do something about it. We're getting you money for projects. And cities have responded saying, here's what we need. Here's our top priority. So kudos to, again, our staff for getting it out. And as well, kudos to cities. Thank you, Riverside, for commenting on how important it is. Um, I, I feel strongly that this is, this is a great story to tell. Um, I just want to call out two of our previous speakers and one fellow who's up on our agenda from the San Gabriel Valley. As I look at this list, uh, we've got some San Gabriel Valley partners here. So John Fasana and Carol and Mark, uh, if you can save me a phone call to all of you in terms of helping us get those cities that haven't turned in their list uh, in, uh, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just also want to say that this is a very important moment. Uh, you know, this commission was very well known for its efforts in, in uh, Prop 1B funds distribution. And once again, here we are in a position to where working with cities throughout the state of California uh, and many of the stakeholders, we're seeing real work happening uh, right away. And I can tell you, uh, and I see Aaron Sass here from uh, the League of Cities in the Riverside Division, which appreciate you being here. You know, when I served as president of the League of Cities, uh, there was nothing more important for us then, and there isn't anything more important for us now besides public safety, and that's to have smooth roads that we can get to work on, that we can get to school on, because that's what drives the economy of our state. And to see the work that SB1 is doing, to hear the stat or read the stat, that you know, even if the gas taxes from 1994 had been adjusted for inflation, uh, what we're paying today is less than had it, the inflation adjuster been in from 1994. And it's just very frustrating for me to see, and I won't get too political here, those that might not understand the, the ramifications of uh, pushing against SB1, but it's foolish, it's misguided, 
and it's a detriment to our state and to our economy. And I just urge everybody to continue to do everything you can to uh, continue to share the word and put th these projects to work, put people to work, get our economy moving, and make our transportation system the best it can be anywhere. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bob, got a motion. Mr. Chair, just quickly, it, the response in each of our regions of the state has been amazing, and this partnership is so strong. In the nine county Bay Area, there are 101 cities and towns. 100 turned in what they needed to partner with the state in this program. The 101st, ironically, is my city of Montecerino. Uh, I have admonished them and they are getting it in this week. But that is the type of need that we see in each of our cities and towns and our county roads as well. This is gonna go a long way to making a smoother ride and therefore a much less expensive ride for all of our motoring public. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, we're going to go back to item 18. Uh, Teresa? Commissioners, item 18 is an information item. This is the Southern hearing to take public comment on the final draft guidelines for the Solutions for Congested Corridors program. The Solutions for Congested Corridors program created under SB1 will receive an annual appropriation of $250 million to fund projects that make specific improvements and are part of a comprehensive corridor plan designed to reduce congestion in highly traveled corridors by providing more transportation choices while preserving the character of the local community and creating opportunities for neighborhood enhancement projects. Statute requires that prior to the adoption of the guidelines, the commission hold at least two public hearings, one in Northern California and the other in Southern California. Statute further requires that 30 days prior to the adoption of the guidelines, a copy of the guidelines be transmitted to the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, the Senate Transportation and Housing Committee, and the Assembly Transportation Committee. On October 18th, the commission held the Northern Hearing in Modesto, California. On October 24th, staff held one additional workshop in Los Angeles for a total of five workshops. On November 6th, staff transmitted the draft guidelines to the required legislative committees. Changes to the draft guidelines, since the draft guidelines were presented at the October Commission meeting, are based on stakeholder input at the Northern Hearing and at the October 24th workshop. Substantive changes to the guidelines include redefining the primary objective of the program and carrying the objective throughout the guidelines. Under the evaluation criteria, we have added that the California Air Resources Board will be consulted in the review of the air quality benefits of the projects proposed for funding. Under the match section, um, we have added, no, okay, we have added that the STIP is an eligible source of match and that the commission may approve non-proportional spending at the time a project is programmed or allocated. Under the project nomination section, we have added that all nominations must address community identified needs along the corridor with a description and quantifications of the benefits the project will provide to disadvantaged communities and low income areas. Additionally, a description of any cost that may be incurred by disadvantaged communities and low income communities in terms of displacement or other negative impacts and related mitigations. We've also removed the November 1st date for when the web-based PPR will be available. And under project cost savings section, we have changed the section to say that all project cost savings at award will be returned to the program for redistribution in subsequent programming cycles. That concludes my remarks. And uh, staff recommends the chair open the Southern hearing for public comment. Okay, um, I'm gonna open up the, the hearing. There's quite a few speakers. So we're gonna institute the uh, three minute limit. The hearing is now open.
uh, Sandy Wong, and then Daryl Halls is next. You want to queue up? Good afternoon, Chair Alvarado, Commissioners, uh, Director Branson, and uh, Secretary Kelly and Assemblyman Frazier. Um, my name is Sandy Wong, Executive Director for the City County Association of Governments for San Mateo County. My agency represents all 21 local jurisdictions in San Mateo County. I just want to let you know that your staff has done an amazing job uh, in developing these guidelines. Uh, they they do a huge amount of work with a very small team. Um, they, in developing this uh, draft guidelines that's put in front of you, they have done extensive outreach and they have taken in a very diverse set of comments and inputs. They've given considerations to all. And in our opinion, the guidelines that's before you today has been very thoughtful, practical, and accountable. So we urge you to um, adopt the staff recommendation. My agency is um, also partnering with other agencies in the Bay Area, developing a solution for a very congested corridor on the US 101 um, on, the, on the peninsula, connecti connecting between uh, Silicon Valley and San Francisco. So we look forward to partnering with you upon your action on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Daryl Halls, then Matt Robinson. Good afternoon, Derek Hall, Executive Director of the Solano Transportation Authority. Similar comments, I want to thank Susan Oliver, staff, and the commission. You've had a very robust public outreach process, a lot of good discussion. Uh, Sandy said the Bay Area is going to be giving you some really good uh, quality projects. You'll be seeing those pretty soon. Uh, on 101, on I-80, uh, we're going to be giving you stuff you can deliver very quick that have major transformative improvements. And I think you've got a very good opportunity for programs. It kind of reminds me of the early stages of Prop 1B when we're all gearing up, let's get going. So I think everyone's excited. So thank you and we're very supportive. Thank you. Matt Robinson and Charkas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Matt Robinson on behalf of the California Transit Association. Uh, I'd just like to begin my remarks by uh, thanking Secretary Brian Kelly, who really during the uh, development of the SB1 legislation that led to all the programs we're talking about today, really pushed to include uh, the solutions for congested corridors, which does in fact benefit transit systems and pave the way for multimodal investments throughout this state. Um, my hat's off to the CTC staff. Uh, they have done a wonderful job uh, from where we started to where we are today and listening to all of our input uh, and trying their best and uh, to include that in these final guidelines. And I think uh, with that, we would support the staff recommendation. And then if I may, just for a minute, as uh, her second favorite legislative advocate, I would like to thank Janet Dawson. Where'd she go? She's back there still uh, for her years of service, for always being a mentor to me, a friend to me, uh, and frankly, teaching me uh, a lot of the things that I come to have known today. So with that, Janet. Thank you so much for all your service. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sarkis, then Ann Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, Sarkis Kacek with the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments. Uh, here today to express our support for adoption of the congested for corridors, uh, solutions for congested corridors guidelines. Um, we did submit a letter of support um, thank you to Mitch and Teresa for developing a great set of guidelines and making it very easy for us to submit some really exciting projects for Cycle 1. Um, for us, uh, you heard about US 101. US 101 uh, between Santa Barbara County and Ventura counties is also very heavily congested, and so we're excited to submit a uh, multimodal application that includes an HOV lane, commuter rail, interregional transit, as well as completing gaps on the California Coastal Trail. So with that, uh, thank you very much, and we support the guidelines. Thank you. Ann Richmond and Thomas Ruiz. Good afternoon, commissioners and staff. I'm Ann Richmond, the Director of Programming with MTC. I'd like to voice our support for the congested corridors guidelines as proposed today. And I'd also like to staff, excuse me, I'd also like to thank staff for their extensive outreach, for really listening to the many comments and for working with us on a great many of the details. 
We truly appreciate the flexibility in the guidelines as well as the focus on congestion. We and our regional partners, as you can tell, are very excited about the opportunities afforded by the SB1 funds, and we look forward to working in partnership with you uh, to get projects underway for the public. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Ruiz and then Patricia Chen. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Thomas Reese on behalf of the Laborers International Union. Uh, the Laborers represents about 27,000 men, hardworking men and women in Southern California. Um, and we're excited about the passage of SB1 and, and the Road uh, and Accountability Act. And we're especially excited about the opportunities for our membership. Uh, with the available funding for projects that have been sitting on the books, uh, we'll be able to grow the opportunities for apprentices uh, waiting to join the trades and build a career. Uh, the utilization of apprentices helps develop a well-trained and safe workforce. Um, and these bills also provide the opportunities for our returning vets through our Helmets to Hard Hats program. Uh, Helmets to Hard Hats uh, connects men and women from the armed forces with promising construction careers. And last but not least, uh, these bills allow uh, the men and women that are already working in the industry with the unions the ability to continue their career with living wages, health care, and the ability to retire with dignity. Uh, we support all the guidelines that move projects uh, forward, um, and we appreciate your hard work and leadership it took to get to this point and look forward to working with the various agencies in our communities to get um, our communities a, a better quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia? Good afternoon, Commissioners. Patricia Chen with LA Metro. Um, our letter was distributed today, so you should have it. And I will just go over a couple of quick highlights. Uh, first of all, it is a support letter. Um, and we are grateful to the CTC for the thorough and collaborative approach in developing the solutions for congested corridors guidelines. Um, we appreciate the focus on funding and effective funding effective and innovative solutions for the corridors that experience the most congestion. We think that this will help guide funding to its highest and best use, consistent with SB1. Um, also part of the evaluation criteria is the use of vehicle miles traveled as a measure of the effectiveness of congestion solutions. This appropriate measure will help reflect the contributions of transit and active modes to congestion solutions. Um, by shifting modes of travel and reducing vehicle travel. So we really appreciate the flexibility uh, to take that into account. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Then we'll close the public hearing. Teresa, item 19. Commissioners, item 19 is an action item. Uh, before I, I make my recommendation, I would like to thank all our transportation partners and the stakeholders, including the Transportation Agency, Caltrans, Air Resources Board, RTPAs, MPOs, advocates, and private industry for all the participation in the development of the guidelines. Their input was invaluable, and I really, really appreciate that. So item 19 is an action item. Um, Commissioner, staff recommends that you adopt the 2018 Solutions for Congested Corridors Program Guidelines as presented in your package. Staff also recommends you authorize staff to make technical, not substantive changes as needed to the guidelines. Staff recommends your approval. Move approval. Second. Motion by Gilmetti, second by ARP. Questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Item 21, Mitchell. I can break this. Commissioners, item 21 is an action item. This item is a request to adopt the 2018 Local Partnership Program formulaic funding share distribution for fiscal years 2017, 18, and 18, 19. I would note there is a pink handout in your packet that presents an updated distribution. The local partnership program was created by uh, SB1 and subsequently amended by AB115 and AB135. The objective of the local partnership program is to reward cities, counties, and regional transportation agencies in which voters have approved fees or taxes solely dedicated to transportation improvements or that have enacted fees solely dedicated to transportation improvements. 
As stated in the guidelines, the Commission intends to balance the need to direct increased revenue to the state's highest transportation needs while fairly distributing the economic impact of increased funding. In order to determine shares, agencies were required to submit sp specified information by October 27th. In practice, staff worked with jurisdictions well beyond that date to ensure that all jurisdictions that were eligible receive a share. The proposed shares before you were prepared consistent with commission guidelines. Consistent with the guidelines, uh, applications will be due on December 15th with staff recommendations to be published on January 10th. I would like to note uh, one change to the pink item under uh, uh, the top section, uh, agents, uh, applicant agencies uh, for uh, voter approved tolls, vehicle registration fees or property taxes. Uh, we have listed San Mateo County Transportation Authority for their Measure F uh, vehicle registration fee. That should be City County Association of Governments of San Mateo County. And with that change, staff recommends approval of this item. We have, before we make a motion, we have a speaker, Sandy Wong. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank your staff for uh, being so diligent and responsive and working with us on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is an action item. Motion by Paul, second by Joe. Questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Susan, you were going to make a comment on. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make a comment that at this meeting with the actions that were just taken to date on this agenda, the commission has now adopted guidelines for every program that was created through Senate Bill 1 under the commission's purview. And this is amazing. And it's amazing because it just really demonstrates the urgency of the need for transportation funding, the needs that are out there, it demonstrates the partnership that this commission has with those speakers that you heard today, those that are watching the webcast, those in every walk of life that participates in this transportation uh, program that we have for California and that works with the commission. And it also demonstrates just the tremendous, amazing staff that we have. And you know, you truly are amazing people. So I'm just so grateful to work with all of you. And I just wanted to just say that, and as Mitch said, the work now begins. We have a call for project, a call for projects on all of these programs, and we will soon be looking forward to adopting uh, programs, projects, in, in excess of possibly $18 billion. So that's what we're embarking on right now, but this is just amazing, and I wanted to take a moment out to recognize all of all of you, our staff, our partners, everyone out there. So thank you. We look forward to continued collaboration. Job well done. Item 22, Garth. Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, commissioners, uh, at tab 22 is an action item. For many years, Caltrans has sponsored a grant program that provided grants to regional and local agencies to conduct various transportation planning related activities. This planning grant program has, was significantly augmented um, with the new funds that were identified in SB1. SB1 identified two uh, funding for two new planning grant programs. First, $25 million to be provided annually to encourage local and regional planning that would further state goals. And then the second grant program was uh, a total of $20 million that would be available for three years to support local and regional climate change adaptation planning efforts on the transportation system. In consultation with the California State Transportation Agency, the Department of Housing and Community Development, ARB, and other state agencies, Caltrans developed two grant application guides for local and regional agencies to consult during the, uh, their preparation of applications for the two SB1 planning grants. The grant application guides were developed with broad stakeholder input. Input which begun last July and was completed in uh, September when the guides were uh, finalized. Although the Commission played no role in the selection of the planning pro grant projects, the State Budget Act requires the Commission to allocate the funds to Caltrans before Caltrans can award the funds to the regional and local awardees. Uh, 
It should be noted um, that the book item contains two different total amounts. The correct total to be allocated by the commission today is $31,886,000. The attached list of 91 SB1 sustainable um, communities grants and 21 SB1 adaptation planning grants are included as a yellow in your binder. Staff recommends your approval on the attached list of planning grant projects for fiscal year 2017-18, which totals $31,886,000. Um, and also Coco Perseño, who's the, the Caltrans uh, District or Deputy Director for Planning and Modal Programs is here to answer any possible questions that the commissioners may have. With that, I conclude my remarks. It's an action item. Paul, questions? I have a question for Caltrans. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Here. Thank you for your work on this. I understand that there were a number of MPO applications that were rejected due to uh, C, uh, CPG carryover. Is that correct? Yes, it is correct. How many were, were rejected? Um, there were four different um, counties, five counties in total. So four in the San Joaquin Valley and one in Northern California. And, and in when these were developed, was there any consideration given to the fact that um, counties who, particularly rural counties and non-self-help counties, over time have to build up their CPG accounts in order to pay for their RTP program, uh, their, the, the cost of doing their RPG, uh, RTP studies every four years? And so that, although those funds may be in there, they may be obligated? So it was... Um so thank you for your question, Commissioner. Um, when we were putting together the grant guides um, that Garth mentioned for these um, very impressive large planning grant programs as a result of SB1 that were augmented, we went back and we looked at the criteria that we used for our traditional planning grant programs and the work that we had been doing with all of the MPOs um, to bring those balances down. Um, and it was became a stewardship issue for us. When we looked at the availability of federal funds that were on the books with some of these smaller rural MPOs, um, the idea was let's spend those federal dollars first and then we were just going to continue the criteria that we had in our existing planning grants that said you needed to have a certain balance of those federal funds before you could be eligible for some of the state planning grants. So that was the practice that we continued. And so therefore, we have been working with the MPOs over the last couple of years to bring those balances down. As you mentioned, we try to work with the MPOs during the regional planning development when they're um, going through a process to develop the regional transportation plans. Sometimes that warrants them to need more um, of the planning grant dollars, and, um, and some years it requires less. So we've been working with them on that. So going back to my question again, did you take into account that some of those dollars that are in the CPG may be already obligated? And so therefore, they may be in that account, but they're already obligated for for planning that needs that they are federally required to do we did take into account that for fiscal year 17 18 but the way that the cycle worked out there were still five counties that did not bring those balances down at the conclusion of the fis fiscal so, year 17 so you did 18. look at what what money was in there but was obligated yes we did okay if they had a difference of opinion on that would that surprise you i would hope that it wouldn't have surprised us I think moving forward for fiscal year 18-19, we've been working with those counties so that they can be eligible for the formula portion. Those okay. counties are also eligible for the competitive portion. The planning grants are divided 50% formula to the um, MPOs and 50% competitive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is an action item. We'll need a motion. Motion by Dunn, second by Keogh. For the questions, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, ayes have it. Okay, we will take a 10-minute break and be back at, well, a little bit over 310.